Yo, we hit record on this? Yeah, we're good. This is for you, Justin. Oh, I'm sleepy, but not the kind of sleepy that coffee helps. Yeah, after this, I've got more work. Yeah, I have men's group tonight, and I'm pretty oh, yeah. sure I'm supposed to. I'm teaching tonight on worship. So, fun. Just read the section in Next Steps. Class oh, yeah, in our class. <laughs> They can check that box. <laughs> Done and dusted. <laughs> What's up, podcast world? Hey, 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 hey. Welcome to the Tim and Lenny, Lenny and Tim, whatever we call the show. We don't even know. That was not fast forwarded. That was me being ridiculous and drinking. It was really coffee. good. Was it? Yeah. Okay, that's it was like the pitch now. change too. Yeah. So it would have sounded fast forward. Like fast forwarded. Yeah. yeah. So you don't need to check to make sure you're at times two, 1.5. Even though my, my brother talked to me about how he would always listen to his books or podcasts at 1.5 to two speed always. Until he was listening to you because you already talk at that speed. <laughs> <laughs> and then it was impossible to keep up. He did not <laughs> I say had that. to put it to 0.5. So I knew <laughs> That was the major complaint. My first year teaching or preaching, whatever you want to call what I do, um, it was always like people are like, you talk too fast. I'm really glad you're passionate about this, but I have no, I have idea, no idea what you said. We're just yeah. shaking your head because we like you. Yeah. <laughs> like, that sucks. I better slow down. So anyways, welcome to our show. So glad you're here. We are going through a book called... The Screwtape Letters. And it's screwy. Last week was awesome, but like... Twisted. Oh, and I'm still kind of in the same <laughs> mental space, so if I can't wrap my brain around things, that's why. Yeah, I'm but it was really good. I think where it resolved was awesome, mm-hmm. and it was really teaching me a personal lesson to look in the mirror, some things with regards to being quote unquote unselfish, <laughs> and really how I was actually being selfishly motivated by being unselfish. So it was actually a really good episode. I thought uh, I enjoyed it a lot, and we got into a little personal stuff with you. So if you yeah. missed it, go back and listen to it. Um, but we are going to continue with the book. If you're not aware of what we're doing, we're going through a book written by a man named C.S. Lewis back in the 1940s-ish, and it is a, he says it like this, it's just a story. Uh, it is, there's nothing real about this, but he does start off the book saying that, and it's about these demons training other demons to influence the world around us, and particularly screw tape, i.e. the screw tape letters, writing to his little underling Wormwood to try and trip up, dissuade, prevent, all those other words you want to talk about, getting this patient of his, a human, off track of being connected to God, whatever mm-hmm. they can do. And so it's been 26 chapters, really, of watching this progression of screw tape dealing with Wormwood and the back and forth and the failures of the demon, uh, and then as well as like some successes he's been having, teaching him how to be strategic in his approach to manipulate not just him, circumstances, media, and the work that's happening outside of them, but also within relationships of people that are around him, his own identity, his mom, his new girlfriend, fiance, whatever you want to call it, mm-hmm. all these crazy things wrapped up to try and manipulate to keep him distracted from the enemy, which is God. Mm -hmm. It's crazy, and it's pretty fun. So chapter 27, it's my turn to read. Yep. You read last week. I get to just chill. My dear Wormwood, you seem to be doing very little good at present. The use of his, quote, love to distract his mind from the enemy is, of course, obvious. But you reveal what poor use you are making of it when you say that the whole question of distraction and the wandering mind has now become one of the chief subjects of his prayers. That means you have largely failed. When this, or any other distraction, crosses his mind, you ought to encourage him to thrust it away by sheer willpower and try to continue the normal prayer as if nothing had happened. Once he accepts the distraction as his present problem and lays that before the enemy and makes it the main theme of his prayer and his endeavors, then, so far from doing good, you have done harm. Anything, even a sin, which has the total effect of moving him close up to the enemy makes uh, uh, makes against us in the long run. Do you hmm. get what he's saying there? Yeah, it sounds like he's talking about like kind of self-awareness of like so in his prayers, if he's if the patient is distracted in his prayers, like because I remember um, screw tape kind of encouraging that, like try to keep him distracted, keep his mind bouncing from thing to thing. And, and, you know, as he's praying and he prays for, uh, you know, his, like the person that works at the grocery or whatever, then distract him with what the person was wearing today and what, you know, and like to keep him distracted. Um, 
and now he's kind of flipping that. He's saying you failed because the dis- he's there's an awareness of the distraction. So instead of just kind of like brushing that off and and continuing, um, there's an awareness of it, and that it the distraction itself also becomes something laid before God in the prayer. Yeah, and and uh, I think sometimes our awareness of things in front of us. Um, like if we're not careful to like take those things captive and surrender them as well, we push them off to the side because we're focused on something else mm. and like, and it keeps us from being present. So like I can only imagine I'm thinking about times that I've prayed or things that I pray about and when I get distracted and how, um, that distraction you know, because I've come into my prayer time with, with an agenda Mm. that whatever has distracted me, even if it's being distracted itself, um, I can kind of push that off and kind of, instead of looking at it and saying, okay, what is it about being distracted itself Mm. that I need to surrender to, you know, like it's a more, um, holistic mm. kind of approach yeah. to faith and relationship with God. Yeah. It's not just a checking off of the box. So it's either right. they want you being religious and checking things off of a box. Like, okay, I just prayed I'm done. So there's no, it's rote. There's yep, no, exactly. there's no meat to it or they want you completely distracted, but your awareness of either one is what's dangerous. Yep. And, and that's what was, the problem here. And yep. what's interesting is anything, even a sin, what do you think of that? Anything, even a sin, which has a total effect of moving him close up to the enemy makes against us in the long run. I like, think a lot of times we, we put Sin is anything that, that, you know, that places a wedge between us and God. Mm -hmm. And, um, sometimes, sometimes like things that are, if sin is missing the mark of what God has, has set, um, then it seems to me that like there are, there are sin there is sin or there are sins that, um, I don't know. I don't know how to like phrase this that can be used to bring us like, whether that's through circumstance or through like experience or through like awareness, Mm. like, so, you know, um, if there's an, a sin, if there's a sin that then, opens my eyes or gives me awareness to my predicament and then causes me to draw nearer to God because of that. Mm -hmm. Because I think in our, in our mindset, right? Like the evangelical mindset is like, sin is bad. Don't do it. Right. God doesn't like it. It's bad. Don't do it. And then hide it. Go run. And hide it. And like, but if there are, if there is sin that then convicts, Right. Like, so if there's sin that convicts, maybe it's, um, lying is kind of an easy one. Right. Like, so if I lie and I'm convicted of that, so now I've sinned and I'm, and I'm convicted of that lying, I may actually surrender that to God and draw closer and nearer to God because of the conviction or my awareness of that. So that's a sin that if I had a demon that was tempting me would want to avoid lying Mm -hmm. and would want to maybe work on pride because that one, I'm not surrendering to God. That one, I'm, that one just sits and doesn't. Mm -hmm. So I think that there are, you know, there are different sins for people that, um, when he says anything, even a sin, which has the total effect of moving him close to close up to the enemy makes against us in the long run, Mm -hmm. um, it's looking at it from a more like, like not just at the one piece itself, but how does that piece fit into the puzzle? Yeah. You know? And I think it goes back to what we talked about last week is the awareness mm-hmm. is the danger. Zone. Mm-hmm. So I want the way I talk about it, like Sundays recently, the last, I think few weeks I've been trying to present it. Cause I think really believe the sermon series we're going through Corinthians is teaching us how to repent. Mm-hmm. And that's what I think that they're dealing with here is like when that awareness is, they may not know what to do with it Mm -hmm. and that's okay. Like uh, so often as Christians, we're like, oh, I don't know how to fix it. Yeah, exactly. Just, (laughs) just be okay sitting in the pain for a while that you've you've effed up. And when we sit in that place of what I call, what the Bible calls it lamenting, Mm -hmm. like that in of itself is 
the journey that it's we're supposed to be It's part of on. the process, yeah. And in that journey that they're talking about this trajectory, but so often we're so afraid of the lamenting phase. Mm-hmm. It's sitting in the awareness of it and, uh, con- and allowing the pain without guilt or shame and being naked. Like mm-hmm. standing in our nakedness in the light and trusting God to cover us. Mm-hmm. And that is the danger. So we want to, like Adam and Eve, the story back in the Garden of Eden, they, when they recognized they were naked, they ran and hid themselves and made fig leaves from themselves. Mm-hmm. And that's what Christianity has taught people to do. And that, I believe, is the most dangerous piece of Christianity. And what I mm-hmm. appreciate about this statement is, is that the nakedness and the awareness of it, if they just sat in it and waited for God to come... Who told you you were naked? Now let me cover you, right? That's what he does. He does the Mm -hmm. work to cover their guilt and shame um, in their lives. And so often we're so afraid of like this God that is just going to punish us when really what he wants is to bless us. Really what he wants is to bring about the wholeness that he originally created us in. But if we keep trying to control it, and Mm -hmm. I think that's what I'm seeing here is like, look, if once you come aware of the sin that will lead them to this place, they bring them close to the enemy, that's actually a very safe place for them, but we don't want, we want to distract them from that. Yeah. It's like kind of, it's the distortion of, of, you know, even as a Christian with the best of intentions, God, as I understand him, and just kind of leaving him in that box mm-hmm. versus like always seeking to know him for who he really is, mm-hmm. you know, and like you and I were talking earlier about a, a podcast that we're both listening to now and are oddly in the same place on. Um, and like we're, it's taking us right now kind of through the old Testament, mm-hmm. especially uh, Genesis. We just wrapped up in Exodus that we're now in and it is r- completely reshaping and reforming the way that I view God the Father mm-hmm. and God the God as He is the God of the Old Testament mm-hmm. and the New Testament, mm-hmm. and I think a lot of times when we when we look at the Old Testament, we look at this wrathful, vengeful, angry God, mm-hmm. and and I project that I think a lot on my interaction Absolutely. with God or my relationship yeah. with God, yeah. and so coming back and reshaping and reforming and rebuilding, Mm -hmm. deconstructing and reconstructing Mm -hmm. my understanding of who God really was portraying himself to be Mm -hmm. in the Old Testament. And who Paul is announcing him to be in the New Testament. Really? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And and it's opening my eyes to see that he loves me a lot more than I thought he did. You know, like I was like, it's like, oh, he loves me and wants to, you know, he loves me because of what Jesus did. Mm -hmm. But he loves me because he loves me, and mm-hmm. Jesus did what he did because of the Father's love for, for me. Yeah. And, and, like, I don't think about it like that. Yeah. I think about, like, okay, I have to come before an angry God who's probably so sick of having to take care of my problems and, of of and listen sermons. to my whining and listen to my, yeah. you know what I mean? Yeah, sinners in the hands of an angry God, angry right? right like, there. And we, like, drink that up. Yeah. Yeah, and there's truth to it. You can't say that there isn't truth to that, but there's something more powerful because he's not angry at us. Yeah. He's angry at the the destructive work of sin in yeah. the world, and he wants to make it right. And he can't make it right when we're holding on to it. And there's, like, it, well... I mean, he can. He's God. There's but. this... Like, and he is going to. I, I say about wrathful him. God, but there's two instances where God's wrath is poured out in, uh, you mm-hmm. know, I learned this in the Old Testament. There's only two instances. Yeah. But when I think about God as God of the Old Testament, I think about only wrath and punishment. Yeah. And there's only, there's really only two places where it's poured yeah. out. And one of them, you know, it's uh, the f- in the flood and in Sodom mm-hmm. and Gomorrah. Yeah. And in, in both of those... Um, there's, there's redemption and there's hope and there's love yeah. and like, but we don't, I don't read it that way usually, mm-hmm. or, or I didn't grow up kind of understanding it that yeah. way. I grew up understanding it as like, this is why you want to do the right thing. Yeah. Like this is why Blame it's important right, to like be moralized. Noah, right, yeah. Right, yeah exactly. Because otherwise there's this God's waiting yeah. to just, yeah. and, and so yeah. reading this, this idea that like even a sin Anything, even a sin, which has the total effect of moving a person closer to God. Crazy, right? To think that. Is like, can be a good thing. It's a paradigm know? shift. And yeah. I think it's really it's important. It's a total like, different way to think so about So often we think of lives. God as a justice, God of justice, mm-hmm. right? He's just full of justice. And so often in our, and this is confirming for me listening through this podcast, because I've been saying that 
true biblical justice from God isn't just there's not punishment involved. It's a full, which is what the New Testament preaches, reconciliation. Yeah, a restorative. It's a making new. It's a restorative it's not justice. Punitive, yeah. It's not punitive. It's a restoring to what was broken to making it right. And that's the purpose in the heart of God in everything. Yeah. And even sending a son is to make it all right. That's mm-hmm. the goal of God. And so seeing this word justice often in our heads, we're like, we're standing before a judge and there's a gavel. We're going to deal with blah, 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 you know, all these things. Right. And, and those y- pictures have helped, ha- like, are good for us understanding some of that, like, like the weight of of our sin. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, like that's a good picture of yeah, that. Absolutely. But it's not the whole picture. No, because the weight of our sin, we have to own it that it is destructive and it wreaks havoc in our life and the people around us. Yeah. It does. It is destructive. And that God's heart is broken and our heart should be broken over that as well. And mm-hmm. in that place of surrender is where he makes us new. The Bible says that the spirit produces love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. And it's in that place mm-hmm. of surrender, going back to trusting the justice maker to be, because if I choose to try and be the one to make justice, I can never do it the way God does. Mm-hmm. If God, anyways, that's, we're going into some nuances there, but yeah. all I'm trying to get at is like, I am moving from a place where I am fearful of my sin to the point where I'm looking at my sin as an opportunity for me to run to God because I get to experience his grace. And it's not, that doesn't cause me to want to sin more. It's right. recognizing the sin that is there and going, whoa, now I could choose to give it to you and walk in repentance. And sometimes that process of repentance, it's not overnight. Sometimes it might take 10, 20 years. Yeah. And it's, then it's after like the process of repentance, of I can life. start growing into mm-hmm. seeing reconciliation happening, which is happening in parts of my areas of my life. If I, as I practice forgiveness for the last 10 years, I'm beginning to see fruit from that practice of forgiveness mm. in certain relationships that I'm broken that I didn't start it sooner. And yeah. now my desire is to operate be, be quicker to forgive because mm-hmm. I'm experiencing some major positive fruit of reconciliation, of love, of joy, of peace in relationships because I practice forgiveness. Mm. And so, and that's what, and I have had to trust God to, to bring judge in. Anyways, so yeah, I, that line, anything, even a sin, I actually fully in agreement with that, where if we're bringing it to the Lord, that moves us in total effect closer to God. Mm-hmm. But if we hold on to it and hide and run away, yeah. that's our choice. Yeah. But he's still in the cool of the morning. Where are you? Where are you? Mm-hmm. Just come into the light so he can make it new, you know? And so his kindness is what leads us to that. Um, all right, I'm going to keep mm. reading here. You ready? All right, here we go. I had to, sorry, that was my soapbox. It was a, f- a fun one, so thank you. Um, a promising line is the following. Now that he's in love, a new idea of earthly happiness has arisen in his mind, and hence a new urgency in his purely petitionary prayers about this war and other such matters. Now is the time for raising intellectual difficulties about prayer of the sort. False spirituality is always to be encouraged. Whew, that's a powerful line. On the seemingly pious, pious, pious ground that, quote, praise and communion with God is the true prayer, end quote. Humans can often be lured into direct disobedience to the enemy who, in his usual flat, commonplace, uninteresting way. (laughs) I like how they define God just then in his usual flat compliance, uninteresting way has definitely told them to pray for their daily bread and recovery of their sick. You will, of course, conceal from them the fact that the prayer of daily bread interpreted in a spiritual sense is really just a cruelty petitionary as it is in any other sense. But since your patient has contracted that terrible habit of obedience, he'll probably continue such crude prayers, whatever you do. But you can worry him with the haunting suspicion that the practice is absurd and can have no objective result. Don't forget to use the, quote, heads I win, tells you lose, end quote, argument. If the thing he prays for doesn't happen, then that is one more proof that petitionary prayers don't work. If it does happen, he will, of course, be able to see some of the physical causes which led up to it and, quote, therefore, it would have happened anyway, end quote. And thus a granted prayer becomes just as good a proof as a denied one that prayers are ineffective. Mm. (laughs) Yeah, it's pretty much just like questioning prayer. Yeah. And like, I don't know, I think... 
it's hard to, I, I don't know if you have a difficult time praying, especially with uh, like praying for um, people that are sick or praying for, in circumstances where you don't know what the outcome is going to be. And, and like, I want to pray in faith, but also like, if it doesn't happen, did I just not have enough faith? Um, I don't want to be like transactional with God, like the petitionary kind of like coming to God with requests, you know, those kind of prayers, like letting it be like, you know, if this, then that, but then also just dismissing, uh, like, I love how he says heads, I win tails, you lose kind of argument. Like if I, if I pray the right thing, you know, or if I pray and it doesn't happen, like then maybe God isn't really there because my prayer was unanswered. Yeah. But then when prayers are answered, like dismissing them or rationalizing them yeah. and, and not seeing, you know, and I, I think I talked a little while ago about, you know, how we had to um, put our dog down. Mm. And um, I remember in January praying, like, God, please, like, because he was really sick. And we put him down in early June, I think probably about a month ago, exact, pretty exact. And, um, and I remember just kind of like in January praying, you know, like, like for more time with the dog and, and just like, like pleading with God to heal him and, you know, like some of those things. And then we got him on some medicine and, and he was back to kind of more similar to himself. And then he got really bad again and, and, and we had to let him go. And it was just like in the, in the pain and the hurt of losing him, it would have been really easy, uh, to be mad that I didn't get more time with him. Mm. But then I took a step back and was like, this was actually, God had answered my prayer in January with the, with the additional five months that I had with, wow. with him, mm. you know, but it's so easy in the pain to overlook what God has done mm. because you don't see, you, you, you don't see his goodness a lot of times, or you're not looking for his goodness in the in the midst of your pain, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. you don't, you don't see what he's been doing mm -hmm. to bring you to where you are, um, because you're so hurt and, and focused on where you are, yeah. you know? And so like, yeah. I, I just had one of those moments where it was like, man, I remember this was an answered prayer, mm. but what was hard was we were praying again for him and it just wasn't, it was unanswered, you know, it was, mm. it was answered, but it was, the answer was no. Mm -hmm. And that was, that was really, really, really difficult. Yeah. But at the same time, it's kind of part of life. Like I was thinking about the sin, you know, like talking about sin and the Christianized, like kind of evangelical kind of world is like, is like, we need to create a world where there's no sin. It's kind of the idea, at least in like moralizing things and like, you know, like, like we're the sin police in the world. And like, oh, well, you know, that's a sin. So make sure we push against this legislature and make, make sure that we have laws here or that the church is, is X, Y, and Z. And I think I kind of see parallels between this like desire to eradicate sin in the world, um, kind of paralleling the, the desire to eradicate or to, I guess, eradicate death. Like, like over the course of this pandemic, we've seen the the argument and i'm not saying that life is not valuable but the argument for the preservation of life has now and and maybe you know it depends on where you stand and there's like all kinds of stuff but it has caused us to now kind of like live our lives in such a way where it's like whatever i do i don't want to die and i don't want to cause other people to die mm -hmm. like that's kind of been some of the narrative that's been pushed mm -hmm. with covid of like like your decisions could either cause you to die or cause someone else, someone that you love to die. Yeah. Do you want that? Yeah. And I'm not saying that we shouldn't be cautious and careful and thoughtful and wise and sensitive. But what I am saying is that idea has kind of now infected the way that we've, that we are reacclimating into the world mm -hmm. and it has grabbed a hold of people irrationally to some degree, yeah. you know, there's an irrational response to the fear of now I'm just afraid to get sick. Yeah. 
well, sickness and death are a part of life yeah. but that we don't want to acknowledge or go through. And I think yeah. I, you know, we used to joke about our dog, like, oh no, Artex, you're going to live forever. Like you don't, you don't have a choice. Like we need you to live forever. Right. You yeah. know, like this is a bridge we never want to have to cross. This yeah. is a, this is a moment in life we never want to have to face. Yeah. You've always been here is what it feels like. And you're always going to be here. And I yeah. don't want to think about it any other way. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. And we, we treat <clears throat> now sickness is, you know, sickness and death. It's like, it's crazy when you really think about like, it's something, it's, it's kind of a morbid thing to say, but it's something that we're all going to have to experience throughout life. Mm -hmm. And it's something that we, we don't do a good job of kind of facing or I don't know, maybe I don't, but, but like, you don't kind of, you don't want to think about it. You don't want to face it. You don't want to experience it. Yeah. And, you know, and then that leaves us ill prepared for when we do have mm-hmm. to. Yeah. Um, and I think it's kind of the same idea with sin here. Yeah. You know, like we don't want to face it. We don't want to deal with it. Right. So it's better to just like, like get rid of it or pretend it doesn't exist. Yeah. When sin's like a part of the world, it's a part of, it's something that we are naturally going to mm-hmm do. Yeah. And it doesn't dismiss like, well, then I guess I should just go yeah. crazy. Yeah. It's almost I, like the, it's an analogy when you talk about the prayers, the analogy of sin, it's, mm-hmm. it's either we ignore it and act like it's not there, or mm-hmm. we try to like control it and religiousize mm-hmm. it. And what you're saying is simply like, we acknowledge that it's there. And then ultimately it's one in the end by Christ. And we yeah. have to live in the tension of it now. And if we live surrendered to Christ yeah. and continue to run to him, the closer we're going to grow to him mm-hmm. and the more it'll get uprooted out of our life. And who are we to say what that looks like in the world? Totally. You know, and like, I yeah. think we want to see a world where it's, you know, we want God's kingdom to come. But yeah. um, if, you know, if we're fighting so hard to make the ends justify the means, that yeah. we're pushing people that we deem sinful away. Mm-hmm. So that we can create a little kingdom of God where there's no mm-hmm. sin. And we control here, it. Yep. Yep. Then we have missed the mark. Amen. I agree. You with know, that. Yeah. And, and so I just kind of I don't know how I got on. So you're that, okay with uh, messy Christianity? I think it's <laughs> no. I think we need it clean and it needs to go and just <laughs> That's yeah. what I'm getting at. And that's, that's like what it's gotta be. It literally you're we're talking about like I, it, this is the argument that Paul keeps trying to bring throughout the whole New, New Testament, specifically, especially with the Corinthians, is like, hey, 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 like, it, it, it the both, actually, it's also the religious people, like, constantly, he's going after them. Like, you might as well just, if you think that's going to save you, just cut it off, right? I mean, he gets pretty yeah. harsh at times, and it's a both end on both ends of the spectrum just coming back to, and it's not even a balanced life, it's an unbalanced life in grace. Yeah. Like when we see sin coming up in our life, like I hope we can move to a place where we're like, oh, yay, it's another thing I get to run to God. Like it's another yeah. opportunity to run to Jesus. Like when are we going to get to the point where we have joy to bring our sin to him, like that we get to live in the light and just go, here it is. Yep. I can't, I'm trying, I don't know. I, I would just- venture to say that that it would come with an understanding of who God really is and how he really has mm-hmm. already dealt with Amen. that sin and the security and freedom we have in him. Yeah. And I think that's where I was going with this kind of idea of like yeah. praying and like, if I pray this, will you answer this? Yeah. And if you don't answer and, and like, instead of just trusting God and, and walking forward with him, you know, I'm reading ahead. <laughs> you ready? Yeah. Okay. You being a spirit, will find it difficult to understand how he gets into this confusion. Mm -hmm. (laughs) (laughs) This is literally what we just talked about for 10 minutes, right? But you must remember that he takes time. Remember the time issue? That's why capital T for an ultimate reality. He supposes that the enemy like himself sees some things as present, remembers other things as past and anticipates others as future. Mm -hmm. Or even if he believes that the enemy does not see things that way yet in his heart of hearts, he regards this as peculiar of the enemy's mode of perception. He doesn't really think though he would say he did that things as the enemy sees them are things as they are exactly Mm -hmm. what we were just talking Mm -hmm. about. Isn't that insane? Because we perceive that God sees the things that way we see things. Like but he's really, moving along the timeline with us. He doesn't. Yeah. He sees things as already been complete in Christ. And done. It's yeah. fully redeemed. That's yeah. what the Bible actually says. And so often we're arguing back and forth as, it's like, no, yeah. like you are a new creature in Christ. Yeah. I thought, Live like it. You know, we are kind of on the same. Uh, Sorry, I'm yelling. On the same page with this. <laughs> we're, we're listening through a podcast yeah. uh, kind of. Not together, but at the same time. Yeah. Uh, and one of the things that they point out is the name that God gives himself, like the name, um, 
that he gives to Moses when he starts getting concerned mm. about, like, yeah. this is the first time, like, God had been called different names by people, yeah. but this is the first time that God in in the narrative kind of has given the name mm-hmm. for himself. Yeah. And uh, if if you take the three words of... of um, to have been, mm-hmm. to be, and to be to come. Mm-hmm. And you had, tr- I loved this uh, illustration they used, but you took three transparencies that had the Hebrew word for to have been, to presently be, and to to f- be in the future, that those, th- if you line them up on top of each other, the word that that creates from the overlap is the word that God gives for himself yes. to Moses, the I am, yes. the I am he who, who was, who Yahweh. is, and is to come. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And like that is kind of goes along with this idea. Yeah. I, I feel like my prayers, I have this expectation or I'm praying to a God that is stuck in the timeline, moving a long time at my pace. And instead of being able to trust the answered and the denied, or all prayers are answered, but the answer is usually yes, no, or wait, right? And like the yeses I usually want and the nos and the waits are the ones where like I have tension with this God that is that I perceive as moving a long time mm-hmm. with me. Oh, wait. I don't know why we just... Oh. So this idea of like praying to a, a God that I perceive as moving a long time with me yeah. instead of understanding that I am praying to God that was, is, and is to come right. and that is ahead of me and sees mm-hmm. my future with the same clarity that he sees my present and my past. Mm-hmm. Um, and in, Even and, with all the choices we make. Yeah. A freedom. Yeah. It's yeah. Because I do have the, you know, like, mm-hmm. like I punched you and that was not God... Willing, you. willing me to do that, right? That was like my own, like, so yeah. there's that, we live in that weird place, yeah. but, um, I don't know, just, this is talking a lot about prayer yeah. and those things. And I think that's, what's hard is as people, we tend to project onto God, our own experience. When the Bible talks about us, this is not our present reality. And that's yeah. what he said, as a spiritual being, you don't understand the human's perspective. Right. And they're not even eternal. These things They're are created beings. beings. Yeah. Isn't that insane? And so even what they understand is above what we understand, like angels and demons. Mm-hmm. But yet there's something even greater because the reality we live in today is but a shadow of that which is to come. Yep. And so that's where I think that we have to remember so often we, our body, all of creation is groaning for the day when all will be revealed, when all will be made mm-hmm. new. And we live in that tension and we are living in the waiting. Like Jesus says, joy will come. It's like being the birth of the baby. Like we're in the groanings of childbirth. It's painful. It's bloody. It's disgusting. There's pain. There's hurt. And we want to get rid of it because that's heaven crying out to us. Fix it, fix it, fix it, fix Mm -hmm. it. And when we try to grapple with fixing it ourselves, that's when we try to become God. It's Mm -hmm. eating of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And so I'm just, it's a practice that I think that's like so often the church, we've set up these rules and these standards that are biblical and we need to learn to walk to create and, and grow in a place where we've seen the kingdom of heaven be effective here where heaven is made known? Mm -hmm. Yes. But too often we become finger pointing, arrogant, and it's motivated by control and fear and not in freedom in Christ. So Mm. let's see what else they say here. It says, he goes on, if you uh, try to explain to him that men's prayers, going back to prayer today, are one of the innumerable co-ordained with which the enemy harmonizes the weather of tomorrow, he would repay that then the enemy always knew men were going to make those prayers and... So this is the predestination argument, mm-hmm. right? If so, they did not pray freely, but were predestined to do so. Oh, there, he just mm-hmm. ended it, right? And he would add that the weather on a given day can be traced back through its causes to the original creation of matter itself, so that the whole thing, both on the human and on the material side, is given, quote, from the world go. So from the from beginning the of time, go, yeah. this was set, right? What he ought to say, of course, is obvious to us, that the problem of adapting the particular pe- peculiar weather to the particular prayer is merely the appearance at two points in his temporal mode of perception of the total problem of adapting the whole spiritual universe to the whole corporate universe. Here we go. That creation 
in its entirety operates at every point of space and time, or rather that their kind of conscious forces them to enter the whole self-consistent creative act as a series of successive events. <laughs> okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just summarize this really quick. Go for it. Let's hear it. Uh, we live with a two-dimensional understanding yeah. and God is working on like the eighth with like That's eight it. different dimensions. Yeah. We, yeah. And we see, we see two things or we see one thing from our perspective mm -hmm. and don't understand that there's 13,000 other things that have gone into play yeah. that are at work. And so instead of releasing and trusting God, that's it. we just try to explain it away. On both ends. Yeah, on both ends. And either we just are so afraid of it. It's like almost the yeah. argument of the devil where it's like either we just ignore he even exists or we get too obsessed with it. It's like either one, we're trying to control the outcome. Even if we're not trying to control the outcome, we're trying to control it by not controlling it. And so I think that's what they're stating here with prayer and our outcome of that. That's, that's yeah, that's what I would have stated too. So it goes yep. on. Why that creative act leaves room for their free will is the problem of problems. <laughs> the secret behind the enemy's nonsense about love, how it does so is no problem at all. For the enemy does not foresee the humans making their free contributions in a future, but sees them doing it so in his unbounded now, which is what we were mm -hmm. saying, right? And obviously to watch a man doing something is not to make him do it. <laughs> so when you punched me, he already saw that in the unbound now. In the unbound now. <laughs> it may be replied that some middlesome human writers, notably whoever this person is, both theists, have let out this secret out, but in the intellectual climate with which you have last succeeded in producing th throughout Western Europe, you needn't bother about that. And I think what he's referring to there is Western thought is very linear in nature, and this is something we're learning going through that podcast, is that really the reality is when the scriptures were written is very uh, modular, it was much more like everything kind of touches everything and yeah. being caught up in mystery. And the fact that we have to have all the A plus B equals C is actually mm -hmm. wrecking our ability to see that there's a magnitude of a world that's operating outside of what we see, and it actually impacts. Yeah. Well, I mean, think about some of the themes that are being touched on. Like, I'm large, I feel largely lost, uh, just because there's so much to take in. Um, because Lewis is touching on themes of, of time, yeah. of, uh, will and mm -hmm. predestination and freedom of, of will, uh, and answered prayers and, and unanswered and like the, the operatings and the workings of God that are just, um, there are theological, like, Thinkers and writers, I would say that Lewis is one of them, um, that uh, that have been able to grasp maybe with more clarity and then try to communicate with more clarity um, some of these themes and ideas. Um, and but the climate, right? Like so, it says it may be replied that some meddlesome human writers, notably uh, both both theists. Um, have let this secret out about like time and, yeah. and, you know, like people have worked through this stuff, but there's currently a, um, like an intellectual climate of, you know, realism and, uh, science, you know, quote mm -hmm. unquote science and those things that like, we don't talk about what an eternal God looks like yeah. because we're so focused on, you know, a linear, uh, earth. Yeah. And some of those things. Yeah. yeah. You know, it's interesting. It's like you start talking about mysticism in Christianity and you freak people out. Yeah. You got in trouble for that. But it's a mis a it's yeah. a mystic, like it's, it, you'll get what? Yeah. Uh, yeah. You start, I don't know. You start questioning or kind of like stirring the turd yeah. with, with outside of the box thinking. Yeah. Like we were designed to like yeah. to ask these questions and to go there. Yeah. But because it disrupts the easy mm -hmm. not that they're easy answers, no. but they're they're quantifiable. Uh, and they're the accepted answers. Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. Once you start questioning the accepted answers within faith, you know, then it's like, oh, that's well, you're just that's just heresy. You're just, you know, you're just you're on the fringe now. You've walked too far. And it's like I think that we've lost a lot of really good thinkers because we have we have pushed them Demonized. out because they have questioned or they have thought about things that we don't really want 
to have thought about because it gets messy. It's, it's settled. Yeah, yeah. Like things that we've convinced ourselves are settled yeah. because it, it was to the tradition I grew up it's, with. It's easier to lead yeah. through rules, yeah. you know, instead of relationship. Um, I'm going to go on here. Only the learned read old books. And we have now so dealt with the learned that they are all men, the least likely to acquire wisdom by doing so. Rough. <laughs> So knowledge puffs up. Like it just, it's, yeah. it's without love. Uh, we have done this by inoculating the historical point of view. The historical point of view, put briefly, means that when a learned man is presented with any statement in an ancient author, the one question he never asks is whether it is true. So this is what we were just talking about. Mm. He asks who influenced the ancient writer and how far the statement is consistent with what he said in other books and what phase in the writer's development or in the general history of, uh, of thought it illustrates and how it affected later writers and how it often it has been misunderstood, especially by the learned man's own colleagues, and what the general course of criticism on it has been for the last 10 years, and what is the present state to the question. So meaning, instead of just looking at it and kind of wrestling with it, you have and all just these asking, other qualifiers. is this true or not? Yeah. yeah. It goes on, to regard the ancient writer as possible source of knowledge to anticipate that what he said could possibly modify your thoughts or your behavior, this would be rejected as un. Utterably, Utterably simple-minded. <laughs> and since we cannot deceive the whole human race at all uh, all the time, it is most important thus to cut every generation off from all others. Mm. For while learning makes a free commerce between the ages, there's always the danger that the characteristic errors of one may be corrected by the characteristic truths of another. Mm. Whew. But thanks be to our father and the historical point of view, great scholars are now as little nourished by the past as the most ignorant mechanic who holds that history is bunk. Mm. <laughs> oh, man. You're affectionate, Uncle Screwtape. And now you can add that right now. The big thing is like the Christians with science. They're mm -hmm. just, you know, they're just not into science and they're afraid of science and that whole conversation there. And that's another reason why, like I talked to some re psychologists recently um, like Christianity rejected the science of psychology for years. And mm -hmm. now they're grappling with, oh crap, what have we been doing? It's yeah. hundred years old now. It's newer science and they're nowhere near the front end of it. And they're, they're, and they've just denied the, denied, denied the importance of understanding the philosophy, like the, the and now like the social emotional, and it still is a huge issue. And yeah. it's, you talk to Christian, like I've got a couple friends that are, are growing in this field and what has been learned over the last 20 years has dramatically changed. Mm -hmm. And you still have Christian professors teaching psychology, like from 40 years ago, because they're rejecting the idea of the nuance. And the 40 years ago is like, it's separating the gospel from psych modern psychology and mm -hmm. the science of the brain. It, it's dangerous. And it's very interesting. I do believe like as Christians, we need to start exploring that and moving towards and asking those questions. But it, there people are really afraid of looking into the science of those things. And if the, the if what we believe holds true, then, then it will hold true period. in the midst of That's changing, it. changing understandings of yeah. those things. But I think... I think a lot of the the drive to to not um, like compare things to what has been taught and to just kind of blind like expect like blind belief uh, is that um, it was misapplied in the first place. Yeah, you know, yeah. I like I th I think about is it Galileo who who was spurned by the church for for claiming that. That the earth was not the center of the universe, oh, but it was, it, yeah. but, but the sun I think was, was burned or killed for that. Wasn't yeah, it? Yeah. I'm pretty sure. And then the, the church had to, to go back and be like, uh, we, have done we that. were wrong, you know, but yeah. like how often, and that's a big thing. Mm -hmm. What about the subtle things that we don't really like to going question? Going back to last one, yeah, the little back, seeds. Yeah. Going yeah. back. No, yeah. No, those no. little seeds are like, yeah. what are those things that like that we're fighting over that are not worth fighting over. There's a simple answer. Is this true or is it not? Yeah. And, but I don't know, kind of like, I also think too the insecurity of pastors. Yeah. They don't like not knowing or saying, I don't know. Mm -hmm. And I think that we have to learn to say, I don't know and be confident and okay with it's a journey. I think what's even more than more dangerous than saying I don't know is saying I know when that's you don't, what I'm when, saying when you don't and they make some or they go read two books and they're like yeah yeah that that that's the answer and it's like or it's just what's been handed down that, for, oh that especially yeah. you know and I'm reading through certain portions of scripture and then I'm like man like I my 
this, I get what you're saying is true, yes, yeah. but there's a deeper layer. It's so much deeper. Like there's an emotional work that God wants, emotional, spiritual, physical, yeah. I, metaphysical, yeah. like deep work that's happening on a level of mystery that we should just sit in and be okay with not yeah. having the answer. And I feel like so often we're push, 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 push to have these answers. I'm like, let's be okay with presenting it and trusting the spirit to work. And it might be 10, 20 or never. Yeah. We might never get those answers. And be okay with that. Yeah. I'm in wow. that place, right? Like just, you know, briefly, but like uh, creation and reading Genesis one as an account of how God created the universe and how, how staunchly that is defended through like the evangelical community. And I, you know, it's like, it's heresy to, to work against that. Even, even if you're outside of like the literal seven day or the figurative seven day, like some of those things, like that's still a box that you're kind of allowed. They've expanded the box and you're allowed to play in that. But anything outside of that is like, is danger zone for a lot of people. And I don't know, the more that I've kind of delve into it. It's like, I'm not, I wasn't there, so I can't say, but the way that we read that account from a, we from a Western perspective versus you have like to answer it with science instead yeah, of just like, being caught up in the mystery of it. Like the idea that we like a Western mindset reads things for facts. Mm -hmm, exactly. And so if this was written and I'm reading it, you know, I'm reading it for, okay, God is just wanting to tell me what he did on the first day, on the second day, on the third day, versus like the Eastern perspective of the culture and the people that it was written to and, and the what, chiasms, the, the poetry the within that, it. That, that exist within yeah, it for yeah. discovering. Yeah. But like the second you start walking down that path, you're walking against the grain. And I think that there are a lot of people and maybe listening, maybe not that are, that are having tension and frustration with the or just a difficult time walking forward in the uh, Christian faith because there are thing there are parts of the Christian faith that have been so poorly explained or that are so poorly expected to just be blindly believed that uh, that we're not opening up for the conversation. I think the prayer that I it just popped in my head is when the the man came to Christ wanting to have his son healed. Mm -hmm. right? so I think it's Mark five or six. And Jesus says, if you believe and his response was, I believe, but help my unbelief. Yeah. And I think that's the tension that we're talking about. Yeah. It's like, can we be okay as a people to sit in? Cause God answered that prayer to him yeah. because that was a words of faith. I believe, but help my unbelief. And mm -hmm. so can we sit in this place where we read through Genesis one through two mm -hmm. and we sit in there and go, can I, I believe, but help my unbelief and like sit there for the yeah. rest of our life. That is an okay place to be. But what if it, what if like that's, a, what if that should be a celebrated that, what place if the to pursuit be? of that instead of just accepting it, the pursuit of it actually deepens yeah, absolutely. your relationship with God and, and your understanding it. of God. Amen. Is that not better than blindly just uh, I think giving into like just kind of rolling over and dying and saying, okay, then like, I'll just accept, you know, yeah. this, that, or the other from it. And, but like, that's kind of, you know, in the last, I don't know how many, how many years mm -hmm. as we've kind of like the Christian education of these things has kind of reduced it down to that. Yeah. So I don't know. I think that there are some other things we talk about. You and know, I know predestination people, came up here. Oh my gosh, we talked about it was crazy. time, eternity, yeah. like like some of these things, like if you're struggling with these things, I think that God's more interested in your heart in struggling through them and connecting yeah. with him, and bringing him to than him. in than in just conceding to the answer that you're that's told it. from the church. That's so good. You know? Whether it's an answer you've heard in the past or a new mm -hmm. answer, the back and forth and journey, 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 you know, and the two sides that keep fighting with one another. It's yep. like Let's stop. Let's stay surrendered. Let's walk in the place. That's the reason why it's called a walk of faith. Yeah. And it's not blind. It's not just, oh, I'll never know like a jellyfish. Right. It is this journey of I'm choosing to take this belief and lay it at your feet saying, I unbelieve. This is hard for me to believe this, but I want to believe. That tension, I yep. believe, is the tension of Christians that we're to walk. Yeah. I told the other person the other day, I was talking, I made this statement, and I don't know how true this is, and I've got to explore this statement, but it's resonating deep in me. Mm -hmm. As I said, like the gospel is a paradox and any time we're not, it's outside of a paradox. It may not be the gospel <laughs> yeah, because <laughs> it's tension of both and all the time. Yeah. It's, it, and it's, it, it's an answered, but yet it feels unanswered. Mm -hmm. It's this decision that has been done, but it's not yet. And that's the way mm 
mm-hmm. described constantly. And I live in this place where like, wait, 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 Jesus says to lay down our life for it to be lifted up. That's mm-hmm. the paradox, right? It's this, oh, I must be a servant to be a leader mm-hmm. in order to be selfish or unselfish. I first have to recognize my selfishness. Like, mm-hmm. wait, what? We just talked about that last yeah. paragraph, right? It's this paradox of... I believe, but help my unbelief. That is the tension. Mm -hmm. And so I I think, I think, and I'm really wrestling with this place. That is the place as Christians where to live. Mm -hmm. I don't like it there. No one likes it there. I want it neat and tidy. (laughs) I don't want any of that. And that's that's where Paul says, we have to be good steward of the mystery that God has given us. That's our only journey. And it's this mystery of the gospel. And it's just keep unraveling the mystery. And the answer will happen at some point. But are we okay with journeying towards the mystery? Yeah. Or the answer is that we don't expect. I think part of it's just being okay with surrendering. Like at the end of the day, it's not, it's, it's just trusting the answers that we, the story. yeah, it's trusting the story, you know, and it's just <laughs> believing that God is good and that he loves us and has our best interest in Amen. mind and that we're good enough. And that, you know, like he wants, he wants to work with yeah. us. Like he cool. just wants to bring his kingdom the, here on the earth. The more I read the story, it doesn't start in Genesis three. It starts in Genesis one. Yeah. The more and more I read this thing, it does not start in number three with sin. Yeah. Yeah. It starts with a good God who created a world for community and relationship. It's so hard because I've been so trained to start at three. Yep. Yeah. And just like, because that's our here and it now. It starts in one yeah. and it ends in Revelation with glory. It's good. That it will it's all good to be good. brought back. I think we're used to reading it. It's bad to good. It's, it's bad to worse to good. <sighs> Well, so good. We're going to keep going oh, yeah, in our yeah, conversations. Yeah. we got a few more chapters, but we're going to take our time. If you guys have any comments or thoughts, if we just said a lot of stuff. You can see Lenny and I both are processing. Dude, I'm like glazed over. If you're not glazed over, you probably weren't listening. Anyways, <laughs> and now you're better off for it, maybe. And, Who knows? Uh, love to hear from you. May God's grace and peace be with you, and we'll see you next time. Later. Bye. Yeah.